Okay, <laughs> good afternoon guys and thanks for coming along to today's workshop. Um, I've got a bit of a cold, so I'm not going to talk for too long, but I'm just going to do a quick introduction before I pass you over to Joe. Um, so given that this meeting is being held online, we're all in different places, um, but no matter where we are during this meeting, we're all in Aboriginal land. I'm in Richmond today and I'm sitting on Darug land, and I'm so thankful to be able to live, to be able to work, and to be able to explore and to be able to raise my children um, on this land that was cared for by the Darug people for thousands of years before me. I'd like to pay respect to the elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here with us today. Uh, my name is Charlotte and I've lived in the Hawkesbury for my whole life. I started working at council eight years ago in the records department um, and recently was appointed as the sustainability officer. I've had the pleasure of meeting uh, and chatting with you by email, some of you already, um, and I look forward to continuing to meet with you as we work towards the common goal um, of a more sustainable Hawkesbury. Uh, so today's workshop is going to be presented by Joe from Good for the Hood, uh, and Joe is a Sydney-based sustainability educator and speaker with experience in the health sectors, in environmental compliance and behaviour change. Uh, so if you have any questions throughout the workshop, uh, you can use the raise hand function. It's pretty um, we've only got a few people here, so I think it's a bit more casual and you can chat throughout the workshop. Um, but if you want, you can also use the chat function um, to ask the question and then we can address it later on. So I'll pass it over to Joe now. Thank you so much, Charlotte, and welcome everyone. I hope you're having a reasonably warm-ish day in the Hawkesbury. Uh, I am down in North Ryde. I uh, live here and work here as well. I'm on Darug land also. Uh, and uh, thank you and uh, welcome today. Uh, we are talking about plastic today and uh, whether it's actually possible to live in 2022 uh, somewhat plastic free. Uh, and that'll be the, the topic of discussion today. I'm gonna share my screen now. Uh, I would encourage you to ask questions along the way. Uh, it's more than likely a question that other business owners, uh, staff, retailers, makers, growers, um, whatever your circumstances are, they're more than likely questions that other people are having as well. There's no bad questions. There's no silly questions. Um, and I'm sure they're questions that have come up before. Uh, we know this area is incredibly complicated. There's no one right solution for every person or every business. So please make sure that you get the most out of today by asking those questions um, as they arise. Uh, so thank you. As Charlotte mentioned, we're here um, because of the support of Hawkesbury Council. Um, they've been really looking at how they can support businesses. Uh, last um, couple of weeks ago, they looked at some food waste workshops um, and now they're running a session on plastic free living for businesses and then also for the community next week. And uh, this is because they share a view that, uh, you know, we not only should have thriving businesses, but we need to support our communities to reduce litter, uh, to reduce the waste that we create and have to manage, uh, and also that there should be more effective and resource efficient ways of operating. So we're here today to look at some of those things, um, and we're going to cover a fair amount in this session. And uh, the idea is to give you some context some constructs and then give you some strategies and ideas. And then hopefully we can also talk through any specific questions or thoughts you're having. So we can maybe come up with some specific suggestions that are a bit more tailored for your circumstance as well. Uh, so today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the plastic problem that we have. Um, most people know enough about it to know that it is a problem. Uh, we're gonna look at how far we've come, whether we've actually getting better or worse uh, these days um, and what the legislation is going to force us to do in many respects uh, if we haven't already taken some steps towards a few of the, the things um, that it's going to make us do anyway. Um, I'm also going to talk today about the psychology of behaviour change because uh, no matter what we do in our business or in the community, uh, change is a constant and, and if we're wanting to shift the way our customers or our employees um, work or uh, operate with us when it comes to particular aspects of the business or sales, there's going to be change that's required. So I want to talk a little bit about what's involved when we do undertake a change um, and how that might apply for you or your customers if we're going to be doing some different things. 
I'm also then going to give you some resources and programs that may well be useful for you um, in your business. Um, I just thought if there's an opportunity and you can do this by chat if you can't speak right now and or don't wish to um it would be great to know where you're from today um i can obviously see your names um but if anyone is prepared to tell me where they're from um in terms of their business uh whether you're the business owner the manager um you know chief of staff or that you're the head of the kitchen or um you know whatever your key role is um I'd love to know uh, because obviously that impacts what control you may have within the business um, and why you're here today. Is it because you're really interested in this? Is it because you're well on the way um, to making changes or are you just dipping your toe in um, and know that you're going to have to do some things anyway uh, in the coming months? Um, so I'm not sure if anyone's prepared to, <laughs> to speak um, and introduce themselves, but I'd, if they are, I would love to you to turn your camera on or turn your mic on and, and say hi. Um, if not, you can enter it into the chat and I'll um, I'll get a good feel for, for where we're from today. It's an overwhelming response so far. Everyone's saying, no, I don't want to. <laughs> Anyone keen to say hi? or put it into the chat if you can't. You can just let me know what organization you're from and what you're responsible for. That would be amazing. Hi. Hello, that's- I'll start, small. which is unusual for me, but <laughs> I'm from Hogsbury Remakery in Windsor Mall. Um, I'm a co-director, so we look after everything. One of our issues is packaging. So we give out recycled packaging. We rarely give out anything new. But we've had customers on the weekend freaking out about what are we going to do? How are we going to pay the fines? And we're like, we don't give out plastic bags. So I think it's still unclear about what people are going to do. I'm sure we're going to get this question for months. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Sharon, thank you. Thanks so much for sharing. And we've got Sarah and Emily here <laughs> jumping in from um, the YMCA camp at Yarramundi. Um, Sarah works in the kitchen and um, she's here because she's responsible for feeding all of the kids. Wow, that sounds like a very waste intensive job. Um, very passionate about a sustainable camp, especially in the kitchen. Fantastic. And Emily, the outdoor education instructor, um, and you are here to grab some more ideas. Um, fantastic. We just had someone else join us. And then we've got Bill here as well. Um, I'm gonna assume, Bill, that you're just either gonna jump in on the chat or just patiently listen and either is fine. But that's great. It gives me an idea um, of the sorts of impacts or concerns or pressures that your particular organization may have, uh, which is a very important consideration when we're talking about this because the thing about doing anything with a business or um, looking at any sustainability step really is that it needs to work for your unique circumstances. Um, so uh, we will be talking about a lot of broad things today. Um, and you, yes, it will be on you to kind of work out what applies, what doesn't, um, what may work and what may not. Um, and um, sometimes that's a challenge, but that, that's where we're at today. Um, and because it is a small group, it is a great opportunity for you to ask very specific questions to your organisation. And hopefully, if we can't answer it here, we may well be able to um, point you in the direction after the session. Um, fantastic. So we're going to talk a little bit firstly about plastic um, and why it's a problem. And, and today's session is directed mainly at plastics themselves. Um, we will cover some other aspects like recyclability. Um, we will look at other materials within business and packaging particularly. Um, but there is a reason we're focusing specific on plastics. And part of that is because there are some fairly significant changes coming in the coming months. And Sharon's referenced them already that the single use plastic ban has started. And as of the 1st of November, there will be some other um, significant for some uh, changes around single use plastics. So we're going to use plastic as a framework, but really a lot of the things we talk about today will apply 
to other areas of the business, um, other approaches you may look at um, and other resources you might want to tap into. It doesn't just have to be about plastics, um, but we're, we're targeting those because of these very specific, um, I guess, indicators and, and pressures that are coming. And also because plastics are an, a great area to focus on in terms of improving the sustainability of your business. So why is plastic a problem? A lot of people are big fans of plastic, um, particularly because they believe that, and you know, rightly so, it's enabled us to transform and transition um, things like our economy and industry in ways that perhaps without it, we may not have been able to do. Um, and we know that um, it's really enabled us to um, provide a, con a convenient, lightweight, cheap, um, and pretty effective um, uh, way of packaging, um, storing, um, and distributing items um, in ways that we couldn't do before. So um, we found this resource that all of a sudden became, you know, quite ubiquitous and it's everywhere. And all of a sudden we're like, wow, we can do so much with this. It could be, depending on the type of it and the color and the grading and the, the form of it, we could do so much with it. So um, there really was this revolution and we felt like we were onto this amazing thing. Uh, but we quickly realized that because it is so robust and because it is um, this material that just is so hard wearing, uh, we've created something that is unfortunately going to outlive us by many generations. Um, we now, it is something that is so cheap to create and we had sort of seemingly endless supply. Um, we know it is not endless, but at the same time, we are using in Australia about 3.4 million tonnes of plastic. Um, that was about three years ago, and I'd anticipate that it's probably gone up since then. Um, we know that um, about, um, you know, just under a third of that is single use plastic. So something that is created for one use only, it's really not something that's designed to be um, durable enough to be reused or cleaned for reuse. It's not fit for purpose for ongoing packaging and, and reuse to be food safe for an ongoing period of time. Um, and we know that a lot of what we use is going um, straight to landfill. There really is no end markets for single use plastic recycling in most cases because of the volume that was required to get enough of it, um, the collection and, um, and um, you know, processing of it is incredibly costly um, and there's no really effective way to, to manage it in our curbside recycling. It just was never designed for the scale and types of single use plastics. So we've created this waste stream, which is everywhere, which is so easy to access. And yet we really don't have any way of effectively processing it or managing it in a sustainable way. And even if we could recycle it effectively, um, should we, is the real question. Is this really something that we need in our lives? Have we really got to that point in our world where it is sufficiently um, allowing our economy to grow or is it just a side effect of consumption? Um, we also know that because of the scale that we create and because of the way that we manage our, um, you know, our stormwater systems and our landfill and in other countries where there's a lack of really great waste management, we have this huge amount of leakage of plastics and that is what's going into the oceans. Um, it's coming off land-based sources. We know it's coming off our streets, out of our cities and into our waterways. And once it's there, it really stays there until such time it degrades we know that it's causing issues for marine life. We know that it's causing, um, you know, problems with tourism. Uh, we know that it's impacting on the amenity and cost of um, our properties, for example. We know that um, land prices are impacted by heavily littered environments. So it has a real cost socially as well as environmentally. Um, and we've all heard the figures that by 2050, that's estimated there'll be more pieces of plastic in the ocean than fish. Um, so not great statistics, but, um, you know, you're all here because you probably realize that we have a problem and that we're here to try and work together to fix it. 
Um, you're not the only ones that believe that we need to fix it. Um, you know, there's an awful lot of noise in the world about uh, this issue. And one of the other reasons that plastic is such a problem is that it comes from fossil fuels. So it's very heavily tied to the climate crisis as well. We can't continually manufacture the amount of plastics that we do without relying on petrochemicals. And um, therefore, the other issue that comes with plastics is the fact that it's actually uh, not a renewable energy. It's, it's produced um, in, a, in a way that has um, significant environmental impacts. The, um, the extraction, manufacture, transportation, distribution, sale, waste management all has a significant greenhouse gas um, emissions associated with it as well. So it's not really on any level a type of industry which promotes uh, a sustainable practice. Um, and there's not many countries in the world that see this as the future of um, of managing uh, our retail, hospitality, or um, other industries. It's just seen as being very helpful for a period of time, but we really need to work on better solutions moving forward. Uh, so many of you may have seen over the years the, the story from War and Waste in Australia, where we sort of realized the scale of our plastic addiction. Um, and many would have thought that, um, you know, since that show, uh, things were really progressing quite well into a increased conversation and then COVID hit. So a lot of people were starting to get quite panicked that maybe we were going to go back to the days of, uh, you know, just relying again on all single use. Um, but what we have seen in that time is a pretty significant shift. Um, um, and I've been involved in community work uh, for a number of years, and I can tell you that the tide has turned when it comes to plastic um, and the conversation around single use is no longer should we, it's, it's actually how soon can we transition away. One of the things that's happening globally is that um, we've seen the United Nations Environment Program um, call out uh, the conversation globally and on the 20, uh, in March this year we had the head of the UN Environment Program uh, say that uh, by 2024, we will have a global treaty on plastic pollution, which she, um, Inga Anderson described as the most important international multilateral environmental deal since the Paris Climate Accord. Um, so this will be a legally binding agreement internationally that will have uh, implications for how we manufacture extract, process, and manage uh, plastics, particularly single-use plastics. Um, so change is coming globally. We will have to be, um, we will have to comply with this accord. Um, you know, we, we will be signatories, I imagine, um, as we are to the Paris Climate Agreement, and there'll be targets that we have to meet. Um, the good news is that Australia is already on its way um, when it comes to this. Um, and um, but we will have a, a significant um, focus on this internationally. The other interesting aspect of this is that um, Inga Anderson said at the discussion around this that this is coming from one reason and one reason only: public impatience. Is that communities are no longer accepting that this is how we should live, um, and basically she said that. The public have had enough. They don't. They don't want this level of pollution or contamination across our uh, waterways, our land, and we only need to look at countries without proper waste management infrastructure to see the absolute choking um, that's going on when it comes to the scale of this waste. And it's it really is quite phenomenal once you start to look at images. We're not going to do that today. Today's very much about what we can do, not about where we've got to. Um, but we know how we got here. We know we need to change. Um, the interesting thing is that perception um, is something that sometimes we don't realise has changed um, so much. But we know how we got into the single-use plastic situation. Um, it took a, quite a number of years for us to fall in love with single-use plastic and quite a number of years for us to see it as an appropriate alternative 
for us to use instead of um, just washing up or reusing an item. Um, in fact, the amount of marketing that went into promoting single-use plastic as a solution to the modern housewife's um, jobs that she had to perform around the home, um, we know that we're now in this transition away from single use. Uh, how we get there and what it looks like, I guess, is still a bit unknown. But um, when perceptions change, they don't always happen as quickly as we'd like, but they are changing. Um, unfortunately for business owners, often you're at the forefront of hearing from customers that they're very unhappy with the changes that you may be making or are going to make. Um, so I guess it is understanding that you will get sometimes some backlash. And we'll talk a little bit about some industries that have seen that. Um, but perceptions change over time and, and do take time. Um, so uh, there'll be others who will applaud you for any changes that you make. So where plastic's coming from in your business or your organisation, um, there's any number of ways it can find its way into your business. And if it's not in your business, it may well have been part of forming your business before it came to you. So if you are serving food, um, there's no doubt that you've probably had some um, plastic in the supply chain, uh, either getting the food to you or at the grower or at the market or at the retailer. Um, and um, there's certainly obviously plastic that finds its way through those industries and through growing food um, to start. Um, whatever, wherever else you're buying, um, you know, maybe items for your store, materials, raw materials, if you manufacture something, there will be plastics coming through uh, your procurement and, and making it way um, into your business one way or another. Again, whether you see it or not. Um, if something's being distributed or sent somewhere else um, and you're having to ship it um, or package it up to get it somewhere else or if something has to be packaged to get to you, you can bet your money that plastic's probably been part of that process at some point. Um, if you're having to produce something, whether it's, you know, prepare food or make something for your organisation or business, um, there's probably going to be some plastic in your processes there. In your day-to-day -day operations, particularly if you're serving food, again, or if you have um, a product that you're manufacturing or making or selling, there'll be um, even your, your staff in their daily life working in your business, um, they will come across or bring plastics in or out. Um, and the administrative aspects of your business may have additional plastics there. And then if you're selling direct to customer or to another um, business, there'll be plastics there as well. So um, depending, on, um, depending on what sort of business model you have, um, and we've heard a couple already, um, you, will be, um, you will have it in your supply chain and in your, the way that you sell or provide your services. Um, obviously, some industries are a lot more reliant on single-use plastics um, and food and beverage are probably the number one there. Um, but um, plastics are every part of our, in every part of our business. Um, and it's important to recognize that um, and recognize that sometimes it's easier to fix than others. <laughs> so um, we'll be talking about that a little bit today. Um, when we talk about anything to do with waste, we always talk about the fact that there's a hierarchy. If we're going to make a change, there should be um, a top-down approach and, and the best place to, to start is always to avoid or remove an item before, um, before you do anything else. So in the best possible um, solution to a lot of these issues is that you can simply say, well, we no longer supply or provide that particular item. Um, now, in a lot of cases, that's just not possible because you receive a, a product or you are receiving an item in a particular way. There may need no other way for you to receive that. But in an ideal world, um, if you can say no, um, you will, um, and you will remove that item from being part of your business and your business waste. Um, if you do receive um, something packaging and there's a way of reusing it or giving it a longer life, um, then that's an ideal solution as well. So that it has perhaps more than one use, um, or perhaps it is given an extended use um, in that, in that um, part of your business. Um, Another alternative is that you substitute that item so that it's um, replaced 
If you can't remove it, it's replaced with something that has a lower impact. Maybe it's not made out of plastic. Maybe it's a reusable item. Um, then in other packaging, uh, you may want to recycle that item. Say it's a milk bottle, for example. You can't get your milk any other way, but you know that milk bottles are highly recyclable so that you will make sure that it stays in a recycling stream and it has a chance of being part of future recycling. Um, when it comes to food if it, or organic materials, if there's a way to compost, then that's a fantastic alternative. Um, and then your last solution for your waste should always be um, should be landfill, um, but it really is your last solution. Um, so um, it's important to recognise that along the way, depending on what you're trying to change or avoid, that we look at the waste hierarchy and recognise that recycling or um, you know landfilling is is lower on the list to simply re removing it or substituting it with something else. Um, so the kind of the slightly drier bit, I guess, of today is to talk about the legislation. Um, now I don't do this because I think it's the most exciting thing, um, but I think it is critically important to understand this as business owners um, because it has implications. It also has immense opportunity, which is great too. So um, what we need to understand is that there's been some quite significant um, uh, legislative changes in the last couple of years. Um, you'll see last year was a big year for plastics in Australia um, and particularly in New South Wales. Um, so I've heard that there's globally some, in, some changes coming by perhaps by 2024. Um, and we know that um, last year the Australian government also ha held a summit. So um, they had the National Plastic Summit down in Canberra. And uh, you saw a mixture of communities, industries, um, and particular businesses uh, looking at what issues were impacting and what needed to be done. So from the Plastics Summit became the National Plastics Plan, which had some fairly high level actions that the government were going to look at and look at what legislation was required and also what other things would help, particularly business and industry to make those transitions. Um, we also saw um, the, the Australian government have some national pack packaging targets, which I'll talk briefly about. Um, these are targets that have been set up until 2025. Um, I can talk a little bit about how we're tracking on those. We're not doing the best um, when it comes to some of those targets, but it will give you an idea about what you'll start to see in the packages that are arriving, particularly if you're a retailer. Um, the packaging that we have on products is already changing. As a consumer, you've probably noticed that things suddenly are in paper or they're back in cardboard or they're suddenly looking a little different to what they did before. Maybe they're missing a piece they used to have or um, they're, simple, they're more simplified. Um, so we're seeing those targets impact the packaging changes, particularly on large um, brands um, that have that opportunity to adapt quite quickly. Um, and you'll see it on the larger brands, the large supermarket brands, and also um, the fast moving consumer good brands um, as well. Um, so I'm gonna talk about those, then I'm gonna talk about the New South Wales plastic ban and um, the packaging ban and the Circular Economy Act, which is what's gonna have the impact on our single use plastics. So the government's plastic plan um, came out of that summit that I talked about. And really um, it was like kind of the government saying, well, we've got to take a step somehow. So we may as well get some people together. And um, it highlighted the fact that industry are really wanting better solutions and they're happy for change if there are appropriate solutions that they can transition to. Um, communities are really desperate for this. We heard, you know, um, I think it was um, Emily uh, there at the supermarket in the War and Waste, you know, demanding that we need better, um, you know, engagement and we need better response from um, retailers. Um, and so the Australian government committed from that summit to take five actions. One, look at better legislation. One, look at better, a uh, two, look at better investment um, on solutions and, and um, industry, uh, set targets for industry, provide better research and development where there doesn't exist a solution that will, will help, um, and then also provide better community education. And so from that, um, 
they came up with a couple of suggestions or a couple of focus, I guess, for business. And the first is that um, they really need to help business um, prevent um, plastic pollution, a uh, plastic at its source. So it's all right to say, well, we need better ways of managing it. But really, it comes down to how can we stop it being needed in the business in the first place? Um, secondly, that where something can be recycled, they needed to provide um, better opportunities and make sure that there was um, that we are maximising our recycling where possible, because a lot of businesses to this day still don't recycle. And to me, it's a basic measure. It's something that we should be doing as a bare minimum. Um, it's not going to solve an issue at all. In fact, if recycling was going to solve it, it would have solved it by now. We know that the recycling industry cannot cope with single-use plastics and shouldn't have to. Um, we also know that we need to support consumers. And this is a really an interesting one for businesses, I think, because often you think, well, it's not up to me what my customers do or how they come into my business or facility or service um, or camp. Um, that's up to them. I set up the parameters, they do what they do, they leave, and I can't control what they do. Um, but what we all recognise is that there are things that businesses can do which make it easier for customers to do the right thing and also provide an expectation of what we expect. We certainly know when we get a dissatisfied customer that we generally we know about it. Um, you know, so it's a guess about ensuring that we provide an expectation of what we'd really like to see our customers do in return um, or at least support them to do it um, as well as we can. Um, so... The other part is these packaging targets, as I mentioned. Um, so Australia has a packaging target, which means that we should be having 100% of um, packaging be reusable, recyclable or compostable by 2025. Um, and look, we're sort of doing okay on that measure, I guess, better than some of the other measures. Um, now that will be, um, you'd imagine, an interesting interpretation. So you think about all the packaging of things that you might provide or all the items that you can buy in a supermarket and you might think, well, some of it's already reusable, some of it's already recyclable and some of it would already be compostable. But once you dig a little deeper, you realise that a lot of it isn't. Um, and there's an awful lot which we think is uh, recyclable, but is it really? Is it really being recycled and reused? Um, you know, so um, you'll start to see, um, and the most common example I can think of at the moment is, is Nestle's um, Smarties packaging has changed quite significantly, um, and also their Kit Kat packaging. Um, so their Kit Kat packaging is now made from recycled soft plastics, and their Smarties packaging is no longer the plastic bag that you can tear, it's now a paper composite so um, or paper um, so you will start to see this across all um, a lot of soft plastics changing um, but um, it's the onus is on the brands and the, the people who produce this to change that packaging um, so you'll also see that there's a target of um, plastic packaging being recycled or composted so um, that's part of that Kit Kat thing that I was telling you about um, the, they want a 50% um, uh, target for recycled content within packaging. Um, so uh, Coca-Cola's bottles are now on the small, small items, 100% um, recycled PET plastic. You'll see a lot of um, laundry liquids, shampoos, those sorts of containers are now using recycled plastics. Um, so there's now a, a push for that. Um, so you'll see varying levels of um, progress. <laughs> um, and then at the bottom there, the phase out of problematic and unnecessary single use plastics. So there's no commitment that we've got to make them better. We've got to, we just need to phase them out. That's, that's the solution which makes sense. Uh, we cannot continue to just hope that one day we'll find a market or a way of doing it better. They shouldn't exist. We've got ourselves into a bit of strife let's come up with a better um, solution that's not out of plastic. Um, and, um, and so that is part of that commitment as well. So that's what we're seeing directly in New South Wales now. So we're seeing this national, uh, sorry, this New South Wales Plastics Action Plan, which is exactly what the next legislation piece that I'm gonna to talk to is about. We've seen um, 
the legislation to phase out some of the more harmful types of plastics, the polystyrenes that we see, um, plastics which are the number one offenders for um, you know, issues both environmentally and, um, and from, from litter. Um, we need to transition to better plastic products. So some plastics are great for recycling and, and really valuable within our recycling um, economy. Some are incredibly worthless and just problematic, to be honest. Um, they're also looking at other areas like tackling cigarette butt litter, uh, reducing the risk of nurdles. If you don't know what a nurdle is, um, it's the little plastic beads that are the precursor to plastic containers. Um, and if you ever go and sift some sand at the beach, at one point or another, you will find nurdles. Um, they have a habit of leaking through our shipping, leaking through um, you know, manufacturers, um, and they're incredibly problematic because they literally look slightly bigger than some sand, but they are a hard plastic, um, different colours, um, and yeah, a lot of the plastic pollution that we see is, is from this nurdles. Um, and so there's also a commitment for innovation and research there as well. So on the back of this um, reducing plastic waste generation came this new legislation, and we've seen it already introduced in New South Wales from the 1st of June. I'm not sure if anyone's seen any great impacts. I know Sharon mentioned it there, but I'd be interested to know if anyone's feeling the change because I've been to several shops which are still doing the same thing. Um, so from the 1st of June, um, this new legislation, um, you know, the, National, the New South Wales Circular Economy Act has seen us phase out the start of um, a number of plastic items. So, so light plastic bags, um, and from the 1st of November, we will have to phase out a few more things. Plastic straws, plastic cutlery, um, stirrers and um, plastic bowls, plates and expanded polystyrene foodware. And I'm going to go on through a little bit of this because there's always some questions around what exactly that means, who's responsible, what can I stock, what do I have to get rid of? When do I have to get rid of it? Can I just use up the rest of my stock until it's finished? All those sorts of questions. So I'll try and tackle those now. If you have any as I go, um, either put your hand up, uh, just check that I'm going anywhere there, or type it straight into the chat and I'll make sure I cover that as we go. So from the 1st of June, as I mentioned, lightweight plastic bags are now banned. Um, these um, do not include um, the thick fur, um, you know, smart bags or, um, you know, Woolies or Coles bags that we see. Um, these are for bags that are less than 35 microns or less. Uh, generally, they are the white or blue, very lightweight handled bags that we used to have everywhere um, and that you'll still see at news agents, chemists, um, $2 shops, um, takeaway shops, um, you'll still see them around. But basically, they're ones with handles um, and they are now banned in New South Wales. So um, it does not include bin bags or animal waste bags. It doesn't include produce bags at the supermarket or the deli bags, which you put ham or meat inside. And it doesn't include any plastic bags which are used to um, transport or move medical items. Um, you know, that uh, unless it's given to you by a retailer for your medication. Um, so um, it also, interestingly enough, ex includes biodegradable, compostable, bioplastics and other compostable plastic bags, which I think upsets or concerns a lot of people because they thought that was the alternative. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about why bioplastics and compostable bags um, have a place and also don't have a place when it comes to packaging um, in a bit. So um, from the 1st of November, um, plastic straws, stirrers and cutlery will also be banned. That includes swizzle sticks, uh, forks, spoons, knives, sporks, splades, chopsticks and um, food, food um, picks made out of plastic. Um, also including biodegradable, compostable bioplastics and compostable plastic items. Um, it doesn't 
uh, extend to plastic tongs or servers or spoons um, or items which are part of another um, item, i.e. the straw that comes on a popper or um, if an item comes with another plastic composite item attached to it. Um, so, um, which at some point in the future may change, but for now, um, they've left that. Um, exemptions will be offered only in settings where someone with a disability or a medical need um, requires them to have an option. So, um, there was significant discussion with um, people in different aspects of the disability sector about that requirement and need for them to have a safe way of um, drinking and using beverages. Um, so there is information online via that QR code that will explain how you do that if you provide beverages to people who require straws for, um, for eating and drinking um, because of a, a need. Um, so, the other items that will be banned for are single-use bowls and plates. So um, this is, that again includes those biodegradable and plastic um, bioplastic items. Um, it will also um, it will not include uh, single-use plastic bowls designed to have a spill-proof lid. So if you're thinking of the bowl that you normally get a soup in, um, those um, those will still be allowed. Now the reason for that is they can't find an alternative at this point in time that doesn't involve some kind of plastic lining. Uh, and so until such time they do, um, they're sticking with what they've got. Um, it doesn't include uh, takeaway food containers either, the plastic, the Chinese takeaway food containers, they're still allowed as well. Um, so you might think, well, what does it actually include? <laughs> Mainly um, those plastic bowls that you get at a barbecue um, or a plate those plastic plates that you get at a barbecue um, that are sort of generally a ridged kind of plastic, lightweight plastic. Um, so we'll have to find alternatives for those sorts of things. This will also be gone at um, supermarkets. So you won't be able to buy them um, at supermarkets or, um, you know, sort of takeaway shops. Um, expanded polystyrene is probably the one I'm most excited about and also the one I'm most perplexed about why it's taken us so long um, but we know the clamshell um, polystyrene containers they will be gone from the 1st of November um, so it doesn't apply to polystyrene meat trays it doesn't apply to um, polystyrene used to package or transport items um, and if an item that is sold in retail comes as an integrated component, i.e. Um, ramen noodles, um, you know, that come with a polystyrene cup and lid. Um, it doesn't include those either. Um, but it will include other types of polystyrene cups and bowls as well. Um, doesn't include um, other drip co coffee containers, but it will anything that's got that white polystyrene, um, you know, the kind, um, will be banned there. So um, this is a real win, I think, um, for the environment because it's a product and for human health. It's really not a product that we should be using. It's not safe. Um, there's a lot of evidence to say that polystyrene is, is a very nasty product for a number of reasons. Um, it also um, includes uh, the uh, single-use plastic cotton buds will be going as well and micro beads in certain personal care products. Um, so we'll see some pretty big shifts. Most cotton buds are moving towards paper stem anyway, um, but we will see that legislated. Um, so you won't be able to get the traditional plastic uh, stemmed cotton buds. Um, so you might be thinking, okay, well, that's all great, but who does it apply to? You know, I'm a school camp. Is it really going to apply to me? Does it apply to my kids' school canteen? Um, does it apply to my charity that I work with? Yes, it does. Um, so this will be for anyone who's providing commercial purposes um, for retail businesses, cafe bars, takeaway shops, party supplies, retail, discount stores, markets, um, food um, markets. Um, it'll also apply to anyone providing a charitable, sporting or community um, event or purpose. So not-for-profits um, and um, including those that use an art item for storage. Um, so um, 
if your school canteen is sort of unaware of this, it's, it's important time to start thinking about that. Um, the reason why it's important to start thinking about it now is that they've said very clearly that we don't care if you've got 300 plastic cups out the back and you just want to keep working through at your own pace. As of the 1st of November, we do not want you to use up those items. We want those items gone. So it's important now if you're someone who needs to do the ordering for packaging is that you start thinking about that transition now because we don't want you to get to 1st of September, order some extra packaging and then get to the 1st of November and not be able to use it. So you need to start transitioning um, to another type of packaging now. Um, I would say as soon as your items or stores, if you have any of these items you've used up, start buying your alternative now. And those alternatives are very freely available and there's lots of different ones. So time to get to know your packaging supplier and have a chat to them about what you can use. And just as a heads up, this is not going to be the end of these changes. We're not going to see, you know, one pop up and then, um, you know, maybe you'll go backwards. I think this is going to be an ongoing transition now. Um, the next items which have been flagged for review um, are the bowls that we just talked about. And I mentioned there'll be opportunity plastic cups. So whether we can use coffee cups, um, something alternative there. Um, whether we should ever have any oxo-degradable plastics. Um, and, um, you know, those are those um, plastics, you'll see them, degradable, shopping bag. It's like lovely. That just means it breaks down really quickly. Um, whether we should be phasing out fruit stickers altogether, um, whether we should actually be removing heavyweight plastic bags because we know that we've become very reliant on those in retail settings and whether those produce bags that are in supermarkets and delis really should be there or whether we should be using something else. So um, it's a start. It is in many people's minds not enough, but I can tell you for a lot of people, it's enough of a change for us to get our head around. So um, it's uh, certainly going to make some changes for some businesses quite significant. Um, I think that was a question there. What happens to extra stock? Yeah, good question. Yeah, so this is the question. Um, it does either need to go to landfill or um, for some other purpose, i.e. craft, a sculpture, I don't know, an installation. Um, absolutely. That's And that's why I guess we're saying get onto it now so that it's hoped that you've removed that, um, that need to uh, you've used them up and then you've just transitioned. But yeah, if you've got a backlog of <laughs> cups that are overflowing, and I know some community halls that are like that, um, it's time to really start getting a plan to, to how to get rid of those. But yes, and some people are like, well, that's such a waste. Yeah, I guess the idea is that they wanted to draw a line in the sand and not give people an out to say, well, I've still got so much stock left. I'll just keep using it up until, you know, because how are they to know whether that's the case or not? Um, the other question we get asked a lot is what, what are the implications for businesses when you are, um, when you, if you make, if you have a breach? Um, on the first case, I believe um, there'll be a warning given. Um, and um, the second case, if there's a, a continued breach, uh, there's some quite significant fines. For sole traders, it's about $11,000 uh, for a fine. So it's not a small amount. Um, and then for larger businesses, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars. So it's considered a significant breach by the EPA. It'll be managed in the same way as any other environmental breach. Um, and um, you, it will be able to be reported by the, by the community to the EPA. So um, if you see another business or if you are a business yourself that's still handing out lightweight single-use plastic bags, um, I'd suggest you stop. Um, if you, um, I'd have a word with your you know, fellow retailers or other organisations and suggest that they, they stop um, because it only takes, um, you know, someone to report it. Um, and, yeah, there is quite significant. Um, and if you were just using up all your plastics or whatever else, um, time to stop that now. Um, there is lots of information on the website. It is actually quite a good website um, with lots of questions answered. Um, there has been a lot of support from the National Retail Association. So if you've got concerned, um, then um, there's a lot of information and support there. 
So I just thought on the back of all of that, um, it's worthwhile talking a little bit about packaging because um, there has been a lot of significant changes in packaging in the last few years. Not all of them are perfect by any means. I think most of us will have used a plastic, a paper straw at one point or these, these wooden utensils and found them slightly unsatisfying <laughs> or slightly unsatisfactory. Um, but we know why we're using them and we know that um, the technology is improving it all the time. Uh, we know there's a lot more suppliers that are specialising in sustainable packaging. It's not a niche thing anymore. Um, most packaging suppliers will have a variety of different solutions. We also know there's a lot more business models which are developing a reuse or a circular um, supply model um, or a swap scheme as well. So if you really don't want to rely on single use at all, um, there may be another alternative which will meet your needs a little better. Um, so the sorts of sustained packaging which are, um, in my eyes, um, an appropriate solution in terms of better than single use um, are these items here. You'll notice there's no um, plastic or plastic substitute on here at all. Um, so it's a metal, so metal straws, metal cutlery, uh, bamboo, um, wood, paper or paper pulp products, um, a wheat item, so wheat straws, any reusable item, which means plates, normal crockery and cups and glasses um, that are able to be washed and reused. Um, and a bagasse, which is a, the sugarcane pulp, you, it's the excess material that's come from when you when they drain the sugar and the syrup out of sugarcane, made into um, a type of pulp, you would have used it. It's a, um, a bit more heavy uh, texture than paper. Um, palm leaf um, bowls and plates, you might have seen those dehydrated, uh, any types of ceramics, jute or cotton reusable bags. Um, so they're the items that have the highest sustainability credentials and the lowest um, risk of being problematic for uh, wildlife or, um, you know, other wild, uh, ocean um, creatures or anyone else. The problems which, um, the, the products which become problematic um, are these ones. And this is what the legislation is really trying to phase out. Any type of single use plastic, any type of degradable or oxybiodegradable plastic um, at the moment, um, they are really um, designed to just break down with sun or water um, and or oxygen. And their version of breaking down just means sort of slithering into um, smaller pieces. You'll see it, it kind of crumbles in your hand. Um, it's not actually breaking down, it's just um, breaking up. And um, we know that it's those particles still wash into soil, still wash into um, into rivers and creeks. Um, compostable plastics and bioplastics are also problematic in their own way, partly because a lot of them have been designed to break down in very, very, very high temperature um, and uh, factory compostable environments. They're not designed to compost the way you or I compost, which is you know, um, a lot lower temperatures imperfectly, I guess, <laughs> fair to say, and um, they just often really won't break down. And so um, the other problem with these is they're actually becoming contaminants within our recycling streams because they look like recyclables. They might, people get confused when it says, you know, they're biopacks or whatever else. Um, and actually they become as much of a problem as plastic in those environments as well. Um, we know that things like PLA straws, um, or plant-derived plastics cause just as much issues in the ocean. Um, with, they, they don't break down very well. Um, and often people just assume because it looks like, you know, a great solution that it's better and really there's no behaviour change at all. Um, so I'm not an advocate for swapping one type of plastic with another type of plastic um, because it really hasn't shown that it's made any great difference in terms of the sustainability credentials and therefore why are we doing it often they're more expensive a lot of people spend a lot of money on this so-called greenwash single use um, and I think enough time has gone past for us to recognize that that's actually not going to fix the problem which is frustrating because it would just be great if we could do an easy one for one 
Um, how can we be sure that paper, cardboard, bamboo are being recycled more than plastics? Well, first of all, we may not ever know that. Um, and um, I guess my answer to that is that recycling is probably a second issue, a secondary issue. We just want to remove the, um, the plastic element from this so that if it is littered um, and if it is, um, it does escape, that, that it's not causing those issues. Um, I guess if the car, paper and cardboard is going into our recycling streams, um, if, they, if they're going through, if you're recycling in your organisation, then you can be sure that it is being recycled. Um, paper is one of those items which is very, very, um, it can be very lucrative for um, as a uh, commodity. Um, it's got a great value um, and it's, it's in demand. So it's probably never been in more demand, to be honest, the way we're trying to create cardboard. So, um, so it has a market, it has a good um, price. And um, so their recovery there, if we do it correctly and we recycle correctly is pretty good. Um, the problem is that if we're sending it out with our customers, do we know whether it's going into recycling or not? We don't, um, but I would say it's still better than, um, than sending them home with plastic. Um, recycling is sort of a secondary issue. I think the, what we'll also see is that once we set up these food and organics um, services within our waste, which, which are going to come to all councils eventually, you'll see that those items can go straight into, um, into our green bins or our food and organics processing as well. So it's hoped um, that we'll pick up a little bit more um, processing um, and recovery there, even if it's just through organics. Um, so, uh, so the best choice for single-use plastic, obviously, if you haven't already gathered, is recycled paper or cardboard. Um, if you can use something that has um, uh, the FSA logo or certification, um, make sure that it's um, it's meets the strict criteria criteria there for uh, protecting our forests. Um, Use bagasse or palm leaves or bamboo. Uh, great, fast growing, almost um, completely renewable products because of the speed at which they grow. Um, any reusable service, any um, wooden or paper or wheat um, or pasta straws as well. Um, I think we're getting pretty good at not requiring straws as much as we used to though too. Um, all right. So I just thought I'd give you some ideas of what other businesses are doing because it's quite handy to know um, what other industries might be looking at. Um, we've already probably seen lots in our own lives of the changes that happened in the last couple of years. Sometimes they happen so quickly or just kind of make their way through and we don't even really notice. Um, but I thought it useful to, to talk about um, some, of the, some of the things we're seeing in different industries. Uh, so first is um, Aldi. They've um, switched to cardboard punnets for a lot of their produce. You'll certainly see Wool's and Woolies and Collie, uh, Woolies and Coles uh, have done similar things. Um, you start to see tomatoes, apples, um, strawberries um, in some settings transition away from the little lightweight plastic, which is very hard to recycle. Um, they've uh, under fair amount of pressure from the community, removed the plastic bags from their bananas. Um, so um, you can't put, you can't bag your bananas in the same way. Now that might not be in every store, but it certainly has been pushed down from um, their head office. Um, they have compostable uh, zucchini trays um, instead of the old um, black um, polystyrene. Um, they've started to use clear meat packaging instead of black because they recognize that black meat trays are very hard to be recycled. Um, they've put papers um, in their cotton buds, in the stems. They've switched to alternative um, uh, uh, paper and compostable alternatives for their uh, tableware. So that's just some of the things that Aldi have done. Um, because of those changes, um, they've seen a 25% reduction in plastic packaging in their stores. Um, they've set a commitment that by 2025, with those national targets, everything will be 100% reusable, uh, recyclable or compostable. They've diverted 76 tonnes of plastic um, from landfill since they started that and they've um, avoided 
357 million plastic stems from their cotton buds from entering into the market. Now that's what I call um, waste avoidance at the source. They haven't created a product that can be used anymore. So therefore um, it's stopped it going into the hands of customers. Um, this is a cafe example. Um, if you're not familiar with Three Blue Ducks, um, it started up um, in Ewingsdale, up in Northern New South Wales. Um, and, uh, oops, sorry, this is not three, meant to be Three Blue Ducks. That's meant to be uh, Office Works with that comments. Did I get that around the wrong way? I've got some of them. Ignore the first one. Um, so they, um, they installed a milk tap machine to remove all the need for bottled milk because uh, they make a lot of coffees. Uh, they send all their organic waste to community gardens. They actually use hydro panels on their roof um, to, to help cultivate drinking water. So they didn't want to have plastic bottles, but they wanted really nice water that the community could enjoy. So they use a, quite an innovative solution for purifying water. And they also encourage their customers to use your reusable bags and cups because um, they sell a lot of jams and preserves and things in store. Um, office works that's the one that's got the polystyrene um, so they've removed the packaging um, of polystyrene from a lot of their um, furniture um, avoiding approximately 800,000 pieces of expanded polystyrene um, and they've also um, teamed up with um, the red cycle so um, they've now made a lot of their uh, packaging um, fully recyclable. Um, and they've also um, got the Australasian recycling label on a lot of their products. Now, if you're not familiar, it's a little black or white label that goes on a lot of products, which will tell you which aspects of the product is actually for your yellow bin or for your red bin. Um, so because a lot of, particularly at Officeworks, the case or the wood, the um, cardboard sleeve, you might not be sure which exact parts are recyclable. Oh, sorry, Charles, just our second half. Issues with deforestation. Sorry, yes, great. I'll come jump back to that uh, extra stock. To go. Oh, yes, I missed that one. Um, so just the question was about um, potential for deforestation. Yes, and that's why it's so important that you buy FSA certified um, cardboard um, so that it's not, um, you know, old growth forest that's being cut down to create this cardboard um, glut that we require. And look, when you look at why we started with plastics, that's why, because we were having this worry about chopping down trees. Um, I'm not saying that chopping down trees is not a huge issue. Is it being driven by the need for paper in the same way that it used to be? I, I don't think so. I think um, we've got a lot more faster growing um, um, alternatives these days that we're really good at using. Um, and again, I would argue that if you can use anything else or not use anything at all, then that is should be your alt, um, your go to. Um, there's no need to provide packaging um, if you don't need to. So um, don't just go, oh, well, we should just do this now. Um, if you can get away with not having to provide anything or a reusable alternative, then absolutely, that is a much better solution. Um, but if it is FSA certified, um, if it is um, if it's got the right credentials, that's how you get confidence that it's not causing um, mass deforestation or major issues elsewhere in the world. Um, and we are a lot better at that than we used to be. Um, I hope that answered that. <laughs> um, uh, do we know if this has changed? Um, yeah, look, red cycle's a tricky one. They will only work with businesses at scale, I think. And I think that might be the problem, Emily. Um, because they need such an immense amount of volume for them to work with a business. Um, and yeah, it can be tricky. So um, I, I can't say from firsthand, but I'm assuming that with a business like um, uh, for um, your office works, for example, it makes sense because, you know, they're so big. Um, so Brookfield Multiplex, it's a large uh, shopping centre and um, developer, they've um, they actually gone to their tenants in their food courts and started saying, you know, can you um, can you stop providing single use plastics, please? <laughs> um, so um, they've had a fair amount of success. They've started looking at installing water stations um, and they're um, I think that might that red cycle there might actually be um, 
left over from office works as well or maybe not maybe when I got that they're also a member of Red Cycle but um, the larger um, providers are getting a lot better traction with this than obviously the smaller smaller ones as well um, so that's I guess an example of it's not directly their waste Brookfield's waste but certainly um, they've put pressure on their uh, tenants to to do a little bit more um, uh, this is great for sushi lovers or um, you'll see not all but um, and a lot of takeaway Japanese food is very wasteful particularly around single-use plastics um, but Sushi Hub's an example of one um, franchise that's uh, introduced uh, reusable and paper um, carry bags um, they've been doing that for a couple of years but in the last couple of years they've also changed out five of their plastic size trays and changed them over to a different types of cardboard ones um, or cartons. Um, they've phased out um, plastic straws, they've phased out plastic cutlery, and they're also using the sugar cane bag as um, containers, which you can see there, for sauces. Um, so that works pretty well. Um, and they do a lot of corporate catering as well, and they even use uh, the, the card or carton trays for that as well. Um, they still have the little sushi fish and the little wasabi packets and a whole bunch of other plastics, but they don't wrap their sushi in the same way. So even per customer, when you go there, you notice a huge shift in the amount of um, single use plastic items that are coming out in each transaction. Um, and that's pretty significant when you look at the scale. And I think this, they've been going for about 15 years that they've been able to do that. Um, now, this is an example of a business that's received a little bit of pushback from their customers from those transitions. So it's interesting to recognise that it hasn't been all smooth sailing. They've stuck with it, though. And to be honest, by the time they get um, to November, they'll be so far ahead of their competitors. Um, they've already made that transition. They're not going to be rushing or worrying, um, whereas some of the others are, are going to be. All right, so I think I've answered a couple, um, but if anyone's got, again, feel free to um, uh, turn, turn your mic on if you're wanting to ask the question directly. Um, but I'm gonna have a sip of water for a sec, and then we're gonna jump into the exciting world of um, behavior change. And I'm gonna run through a couple of things there before we go and look at some of the particularly problematic areas for our businesses and see if we can solve any of them for you. All right. Fantastic. Well, please just keep um, throwing them up there. Oh, if you have you heard of plastic bricks? Um, as in for building construction, Sarah? Otherwise, no. <laughs> or Lego? <laughs> oh, place plastic in a place. Ah, oh, yes. Yeah, I have. Um, I guess I've seen that in places where, um, you know, I've seen it more in nations where they've perhaps got a, a lack or, or need cheap building materials. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I, 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 do I think it's going to become mainstream? Probably not. But, you know, it is pretty innovative. And I wonder if, um, you know, very lightweight building materials, but I'm not sure what the... Um, how conductive it would be or how heat proof it would be either. But um, I think they could probably compact it in mud. It's no worse than what they do with polystyrene um, in within the frames of houses too. So yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. So um, I guess I just want to talk a little bit about, um, uh, about change um, and that really, you know, we know it's a constant we know that we're facing change all the time, but sometimes for a lot of people, um, it's either happening too quickly or it's not happening quickly enough. <laughs> uh, you're probably in the middle there um, somewhere. Sometimes things, um, particularly through COVID, things will happen so quickly and we have to change all the time. When it comes to plastic, um, we often just feel like it, things should be moving much more quickly and, and nothing's changing. Um, so there's a lot of structural barriers to change um, and there's a lot of... Um, resistance from consumers with change because they would like things to change only if it means that they get the same quality, the same service, the same freshness, the same convenience, and they don't have to do anything differently. And we know that when things change, that there may be some other unintended or intended changes that have to happen because we can't just do it exactly the way um, we had always done it. So 
when that happens, we know that people can push back or be reluctant. So um, it's worth seeing whether we can take those things into account and how we can also leverage change for our customers. So one thing um, I've learned over the years um, when we talk about change is that we are very, very interested in what other people are doing. So the first thing we do when we're asked to change is whether we know it or not, we start looking at other people's reactions. Maybe it's the person sitting next to us. Maybe it's the other business owners in our community. Maybe we go online or go on Twitter and see what people are saying. We're very interested in understanding whether other people are happy, sad, frustrated, scared, confused, alarmed, um, whether they're embracing change, whether they're pushing back. Um, and it's not to say that we don't have our own opinions, but we're sort of a very social um, species. And, and by nature, we want to know whether other people are responding in the way that we think we might as well. So when consumers are asked to change, the first thing they're going to do is look to other customers or look to other people in the building or the business. And if you've got employees, the first thing they're going to do is look to whether other people are adopting change without any issues. Um, where they're looking for signals or signs that this is now normal. They want to know why it's happened or how it's happened and what it's going to mean for them. So perceptions of how other people um, perceive the behaviour can be very impactful. Um, so if you're going to do a big change in your business, it's worthwhile communicating that so that it's not sprung on them when they're in the experience. So if you're going to have a launch of something or change something, it's worth letting people know so that when they're in the moment, they're not kind of in that first experience or so that there's a perception that it's what the community is embracing. Um, it's what governments do all the time. They launch something and they, you know, they're applauded and they're, oh, isn't this great? And everyone's sort of going, is it great though? I'm not sure. So it's just worthwhile understanding that if you're going to make changes or you ask people to be involved in change, people are going to feel uneasy to start. Even if they think something's really positive, there will be a split second where they start thinking, hang on, does everyone feel this way? It's also worth recognising that people adopt change at different rates. There will be those of us like Emily or Sarah who are really passionate, really passionate at the forefront, been pushing for this for ages, might, might be the champion within the organisation, might be the only one in their organisation who are really saying we should be doing this. Uh, they might have seen it somewhere else and they're now saying we need to do this here, guys. Then there'll be others who are like, oh, I don't know, we'll just, well, yeah, okay. Um, and then there'll be some who just refuse to be part of it until either it's law or even then they'll be very reluctant. But it's worthwhile knowing that most people are somewhere in the middle. They don't want to be the first, but they're not necessarily going to be the last. So just recognising who are your early adopters and they are your champions. They're the people you need to get involved. They're the ones that are going to be going and talking about how awesome this is. They're the ones that are going to be sending all those great social learning signals that this is such a positive thing to be. Aren't we lucky to be part of this? And they'll be sort of, you know, banging the drum for you in your organisation or community. Um, other people may take more time. Um, and it's only real when it, it becomes that sort of mainstream adoption that people just start to relax and be a bit more comfortable. Until then, it's quite novel and new. Um, and people might be a bit wary of it. And that can take a little bit of time. It can take years. It just depends on the sort of change that we're, we're seeing. Um, sometimes people will just adopt change with little to no thought, but more often than not, there is a little bit of thought. And um, it's also worth recognising that there are some people who want to be part of change just because it's new and exciting. Um, there will be people who just want to get the new iPhone because it's new and exciting and it's different and they want to be the first. Um, so people respond to the types of change um, for different reasons um, and at different rates. Um, it's worthwhile understanding too that when we are going to make a change, either as ourselves, as business owners or um, chefs or, um, you know, retailers or makers or, um, you know, or customers, that change doesn't just happen immediately as soon as we think about it. There's a process that happens. So you might come to today 
go away, have a think about the sorts of things you could change. You might go and talk to someone. Then you might go back and do nothing for a while. Then you might go to something else and you see something else happen and you might think about it again. And then you might take steps, plan, and then make a change. Change doesn't just happen the day we decide to do something. We don't just suddenly lose weight because we want to start a diet. We have a thought process. And sometimes that thought process can go on a really long time because there's things that hold us in a state before we make change. So when I used to work in healthcare, a lot of what I worked with was people in this pre-contemplation um, and contemplation phase, thinking, um, not even realizing there's a problem that needs to change into that stage of, oh, okay, well, that's not great, is it? And, and then how are they gonna work through the change they need to um, make? So I just wanted to run through this very quickly. I don't want to spend huge amounts of time because um, it's really probably the, the value for you is just at the end in a second. But I just wanted to talk about if you are going to ask your customers to do something different or your staff to do something different or the business owner to do something different or you indeed have to do something different, there is a process that people go through. Um, it's this contemplation of change. Now, I use an example of myself with single use plastic for this. Um, so once upon a time, I was exactly the sort of person who would go in anywhere, accept anything that was given to me, buy anything, use anything, throw anything away. I didn't ever think there was any problem with that. I've never had any concerns about plastic prior to, you know, maybe 2010. I was oblivious that we had a problem. When I heard about, I, whatever. Um, so at some point, um, most people are in this phase. I, what are you talking about? Not a big drama. It'll be fine. No big deal. Um, it's all good. Stop making it. They can justify it there where they are and they're in a very blissful, ignorant sort of phase. It's not, no shame in that. It's just very normal behaviour. Um, and this can be for anything. This can be for being um, overweight, for smoking, drinking too much, any behaviour which we see as potentially problematic. If you don't think there's a problem, no big deal, no problem. Um, so um, things that help people in this space to recognise there's a problem or that change is actually needed is really this consciousness raising. is about awareness. Hey, guys, did you know? Um, you know, letting people know. That's why people put pictures of gory um, on cigarette packets, you know, letting people know that there is a problem, shocking people to think actually this isn't something um, that is normal or okay. Um, it's where people, it's where education campaigns target people. It's where we, we prompt people and shock people um, into maybe awareness that there is a problem. So once people know there is a problem and that requires a whole bunch of things and just because you know doesn't mean you do anything different. We know an awful lot of people say, oh yeah, what am I gonna do? Um, so now we've got people who know there's a problem. They're suddenly going, oh, wow, we do have a lot of plastic, don't we? Yeah, oh well. And they continue behaving as they always did, but they're now aware that it's, it's maybe somewhat more of a problem than they ever realized before. Um, they might feel a little bit of shame or a little bit of guilt, perhaps. Oh, yeah, it's not great, is it? Just put that back here and hide it. Um, I've seen people accept coffee cups once they've really seen the War and Waste episode and then kind of gone, oh, I'll just pour that in my in my keep cup, which I forgot. Um, this, is, this is another um, place where we can actually start moving people forward to other change. Again, uh, we don't want to shame people in this place too much because they can become quite um, irritated or frustrated and, and flick back to, well, I don't know my problem. Um, it's really about being gentle there, but showing them positive examples, um, getting a commitment from other people so that they feel that they're joining a movement is useful, seeing other role models in that space. Um, and also exploring some of those feelings about, oh, why did you hide your cup? You know, what's, what's that about? You're feeling a bit of shame. Why is that? Um, so uh, it's a really gentle phase and it really is the first step in change. Then um, what happens once you reach enough or long enough period of that pre-contemplation, you enter this place of contemplation. How might I actually do something different? What would it involve? You start weighing up all the costs and benefits 
I don't know, maybe I could, oh yeah, I could guess I could try. I saw someone else do this. Um, because they're suddenly at that point where they're like, well, maybe doing what I've always done is not going to continue to work. And legislation is going to make us do this because, you know, we can't as business owners continue to do what we've always done. At some point, we're going to have to rip the bandaid off and change um, what we do. Um, we're also going to start looking for people in this phase. Well, what did you guys do? How did you do it? Make your, what happened with your team? What did you do to them? Or, um, you know, what, who's your supplier for that? We're going to start looking for examples so that we can try it. And for us, trying it is going to mean adopting the change. Um, but for me, when I went to the shops, it was taking my container in and asking them to put my sushi in my container um, or taking my, you know, coffee cup into the cafe and asking if they'd put it in that cup. Not big actions, but for someone who's a bit um, trying something for the first time, it can be a little bit uncomfortable. The first time you might serve a customer in a different way, you might be very nervous about how they're going to react, what they're going to say, um, you know, but you're going to give it a go. Um, you can be quite excited in this phase because you've suddenly made that decision. It's the first day of the diet. You know, you're really keen to cut out the chips today. I'm going to give this a go. But if it fails spectacularly, you can completely jump. Oh, I tried that, not going to work. Um, so it's a really, um, it's a time for a very quick relapse potentially. Um, so just being aware that you've got to make it as easy as possible for your staff to make these changes because they will be very reluctant if it doesn't go well. Um, once you've done something for a while and it's worked, suddenly not so much of a drama anymore. You've adopted the change, it's working well, things are going well, it's just business as usual. Becomes a habit for your staff, becomes a habit for you. No big deal. Um, that's when change has happened. Um, it's when you, um, you know, start to actually celebrate some of the positives. Oh, I can't believe we didn't do this earlier. It's cheaper. I can't believe it. We don't give out as much X, Y, Z anymore. Um, I can't, you know, oh, you guys should definitely do this. This is such a positive thing. You suddenly are in this converted space. It can be quite irritating for other people who aren't on that road yet. Um, but we all know it's a feeling of pride, a feeling that they've done something really positive and you've made it work until such time as a problem and you might um, accidentally st step back and that will happen always with sustainability. Oh, we're going so well, then COVID hit. Oh, we're going so well and then management changed and we couldn't do what we did. Um, so you might feel like it's a, a quick setback. It might be a complete shift and you think, wow, all our hard work has gone out the window. Um, but it's important to actually share those stories with people too, because it lets people know that stuff happens. You know, it, it's not perfect. We're not here to be perfect. We're here to, um, to make changes that last and which, which we can adapt with. So um, don't be afraid of um, sharing the stuff that really failed spectacularly within your business when it comes to sustainability, because that's going to help someone as well. All right. So um, I'm going to just um, jump over into some things that we can really hopefully take away now um, for you and your business um, or your organisation. Um, and hopefully um, there's some, you guys can be as involved in this conversation as possible. Um, I just wanted to say first and foremost that if you're ever worried about um, you know, food safety, um, donating food, uh, providing containers to people, reusable cups and, and any of that um, uh, sort of legislation and whether you're going to be in trouble for that. Um, there's some great information online um, that talks about the fact that, um, you know, you are protected, that you have, um, there are some rules to follow, but you have protection under this legislation. Um, so do not be alarmed. Um, if someone comes in with a disgusting reusable container and want their meal in that, and obviously you can have a conversation with them, um, it needs to be uh, food safe, um, but you're also protected as well. Um, it's, it's not on you. Um, so um, just know that it's, you know, it's not all doom and gloom for business owners who are trying to do the right thing. So um, I think I heard a little bit at the beginning. Um, again, if you can 
speak up. I'd love to hear from you. If you can put it in the chat, I'd love to hear from you. But I would love to know for you and your organisation, what is the issue when it comes to plastic that you would like to tackle? Whether it's the single use plastics we've talked about or something else, what is it that you think we've got to get better at that? That, that one is just doing my head in. I'll give you a moment to have a think. Maybe you've already got rid of all plastics, but I doubt it. I'm struggling. <laughs> Maybe Charlotte can tell me one from a council side of things because I think sometimes everyone thinks council's got it sorted, but um, there's an awful lot of plastic within businesses of any size or kind. I think sometimes when we hold events or workshops, um, um, especially during COVID, it can be unavoidable because you want to supply a snack with the workshop, but at that stage, like it had to be packaged. Um, yeah. Now it's a bit easier. We had a youth forum and um, Adriana and I, we just brought our own plates and cups from home and served the food on that and then took it home and washed it um, because we didn't want to buy <laughs> plastics, especially for the sustainability team. <laughs> there you go. Yep. A little bit of a uh, little bit of a uh, hesitation. Didn't want to be the one that, um, yeah, was seen to be the the mess maker, the waste makers. There. Um, what about you, Sarah? We've got here maybe the cling cling wrap in the kitchen. Yeah. So I imagine I don't know how many kids you you guys are serving at your camp each day, but um, we started using wrap the kid uh, kids wraps in aluminium foil as you can get it and wrap it uh, yeah, into a ball and recycle it. But it seems like we use so much cling wrap in other areas of the kitchen. It'd be great to find another alternative. Yeah, absolutely. And look, you'll see some, um, you know, interesting claims on some of the cling wrap now. Um, I, I've, my partner brought some home. He's like, look, it's environmentally friendly. And I'm like, is it <laughs> so um you know obviously that would be one one version um the claims of that i cannot uh cannot attest but yeah once you've got large scale um cling wrap is is tricky right um so because at home we can get away with you know putting a lid on it maybe some beeswax wraps maybe some um, good tupperware containers lots of trays um, but when you've got large amounts of food, you're trying to keep fresh and food safe. Uh, it's a very, very different uh, kettle of fish. Um, anyone else? What about you, Sharon? Have you got um, anything from the remakery that you're interested in? We've got Emily. How can we get staff on board since COVID? A lot of resistance things seems to be individually packaged for health and safety. How can I get help things out of single-use plastics? Yeah. Um, it depends what it is. Um, if it's, if it's um, <laughs> pushback, yeah. So I guess um, for me, it's always when you're trying to engage anyone, it's actually about having it, allowing them to have a conversation. Um, most of the time, the pushback, it's not enough to say on the fly, oh, no, we're just doing this today, deal with it. Um, there needs to be a team meeting or a, a discussion where um, it's two ways. So, all right, this is maybe what the legislation says because they might just say, well, I'm just doing it because I don't want to get in trouble. So, um, but also hearing all the things, oh, well, I heard from so-and-so that it's this or um, I'm wor really worried about getting sick and I want to make sure. So all of their fears, all of their concerns, all of their issues come out um, so that you can actually address them. All right, well, because until you know exactly what their concerns and reason they're pushing back, they might just be pushing back because it's quicker. Just out, done, easy, um, you know. Um, and I would say with a lot of these things that you obviously got to pick your battles too um, about which items you can actually tangibly tackle um, and which ones first. Um, but, yeah, absolutely. I've, I've had this discussion a lot around packaging at my, my son's canteen and there's a sense that it's safer, better, easier, and it's just the way to do it. Um, so, yeah, it's not an easy one, but particularly, again, at scale. Um, one of the things I would suggest for, for your specific circumstances to look at what other camps are doing. 
um, because you're not the only ones having this problem, even though you might be the only camp within a certain radius or in the Hawkesbury, um, I would be going and joining some other um, networks of um, people like yourself and finding out what they've done. Um, industry groups, again, you know, if you're a real estate agent or a cafe owner or a, um, you know, apple grower, finding out what other industries, uh, other business owners are doing or what other organisations are doing in your industry, um, incredibly powerful because they will have tried and tested things that have worked and not worked. Um, it's easy if it's, as it's not your decision, you won't be able to buy the plastic things. Can kids put their own lunch boxes? Yeah. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, obviously exploring what kids can do. Um, we, I know that at certain um, early childhood settings where there's been a, a certain sets provided that are then set up in this particular way and that then enables, you know, less packaging because that's that's the way everything's presented each day or in each way. So um, there's ways around it and obviously it's going to require staff to do things differently. Um, Sharon, did you have anything else from yours? You mentioned plastic bags, I think. Um, but I wasn't sure if there was anyone else. Um, I wonder if anyone's got any um, supply chain plastics, the plastic wrap around products that come in, pallets. Um, when I, I visit, did a visit to a large comp company that had a lot of beverages and they actually said that was their biggest limitation. There was no scalable large plastic wrap that they could put in. So um, they didn't know what else to use. They were really open to another solution, but they felt very limited by that. Um, I can't believe we're still discussing plastic bags, I know. <laughs> yeah, good on you, Sharon. I know, I know. Who knew Who knew that five years ago we'd talk about the ban coming in and it's only just here. Um, all right, I'll, um, I'll move to the next one. Um, so what can we do? What sort of alternatives really are there for the sorts of plastics in our business? Um, 5,000 bags, that's impressive. Um, does data about plastics held up speed up the plastic uh, psychology of change? Um, look, I don't believe data really does change things unless people are already um, on the way to change and it's kind of, um, you know, it's, it's just another ingredient to it. But for, I think data for a lot of people really is just noise. Um, when you say, oh, well, you know, there's three football fields worth of, that means nothing to me. <laughs> One, the numbers are too big. I don't feel part of that equation. That, that they're not numbers that I feel like I've specifically contributed to. Um, what does make a difference, um, I believe, is... Um, an alternative that's enjoyable and positive. So um, if the change requires, for example, your staff to put things in different containers, which are individual, um, and there's a process to doing that, uh, which is about the same amount of time, but it's done in a way that music's playing when they do it and they can do it 10 minutes before service instead of just when the kids arrive, I don't just guessing the circumstances here, but it's quite an, you know, they, there's no pressure. They can do it at the speed that they can get it all set up and it's great. And then when they come out, they can, they can the kids can come and get their own food and they can enjoy it and make them watch. Great. You know, if you can, um, if you can make a competition where um, they can mark up exactly how much they've plastic they avoided this week by doing X, you know, and the person who, had the biggest impact gets a prize or it's about positive reinforcement for me. Um, again, I'm not someone who responds to pictures of turtles or um, negative images, or I think that can work at that very early thing. But I think if you're actually trying to get people to make the change, then it's about the positive experience. It's about getting the team on board. And I would get those people who are most likely to be on board first so those people who show an interest or who are generally pretty agreeable, get them on board. And that person who's like super resistant and doesn't want to do it, 
bring them on board last and they're just going to have to um, get involved. Um, but yeah, try and try and engage the most engaged first um, and bring the others along slowly. <laughs> awesome. Um, all right. So just remember when we're talking about those plastics, maybe there's plastic in your world that you don't actually see. So it might be worth talking to your suppliers. Hey, you know, what, where does stuff come from and how do you get it to us and what kind of waste is on the way? Is there a way I could, we could buy it in bulk? You know, hey, we notice you're, you're sending toilet rolls to us in packets of 12. Can we get packets of 48, you know? Um, is it possible to buy your biscuits not individually wrapped for the same price? Um, do you have an alternative to this particular packaging? Is there a similar product in cardboard? You know, ask those questions of your providers and um, along the way so that you can kind of get an understanding um, of that invisible situation that you might not actually know there's an alternative to. Um, so one of the other important things is that what I just talked about impact and measurement um, and also how you communicate those changes. So that means for your team, for your customers and also to the community. So I would say um, there's a few things that you can do and this is another one that might help you guys at the camp. Um, one of them is to be part of something bigger. So it doesn't sound like, well, why MCOs make us do this thing we've got to do and it becomes a massive burden. It's like, hey guys, we're actually taking part in Plastic Free July this month. It's going to be a challenge, not going to be easy, but here's what we're going to do. Um, so Plastic Free July have um, a whole bunch of resources for businesses and organisations, uh, and they go through some of the things that you might need to look at. They also have an individual challenge there, so all the elements of plastic um, free living you can kind of go through. Um, it's a perfect time now to get involved. By the time you start July, you're probably a bit early. It's got a bit late. We've got lots of signs. Um, you can make it a challenge for students, for parents. When they send their kids, they know that it's Plastic Free July. So they know that um, there's going to be, um, you know, a, an expectation that they're going to do something differently. Um, I have to apologise. My dog has just decided to leave the room. Um, so if you could just bear with me. Come here. Right, and my lights just come out it's all happening now all falling apart everyone apologies there's a light there we go again <laughs> um thank you um, so Plastic Free July is a great initiative. It's all about positive behaviour and it's got a lot of information about the behaviour change um, process. They know that most people who take part in Plastic Free July use some of the things, make some ongoing changes. It's like that spark that starts something. It makes you aware of the suddenly the scale. Um, another really great thing you can do for an organisation is a little bit of an audit exactly how much waste are we creating here guys because until you know it might be nice to talk about the scale of global plastic pollution but we just want to know what's happening at camp Yaramundi. that's all we care about today we want to know what kind of plastic waste is coming out of our kitchen on a tuesday so let's look at that so um that can be really powerful because then they're responsible for that they're aware of where it's coming from and going um, and there's some level of understanding that they're part of the solution as well so um, i love a bit of plastic free july um, because it really enables um yeah conversations which normally wouldn't happen to to start um and it's great as a business if to get your customers involved um, now, I would say um, some of the questions that you can ask yourself as a business or organisation are these. Can you rethink the way you package things? Can you uh, look at individual wrapping versus bulk items? Sorry. Um, you know, is it possible um, to have uh, reuse as part of that? Can you look at the, do you, is it really needed to wrap something that you give out? Is, it, is packaging actually adding to the value? to the customer or to the client or to this person receiving your service, or is it just a little bit unnecessary? Um, is there a sustainable alternative for what you've got? You know, is if clean wrap is not the answer, then what is? You know, is there actually another alternative? And in many cases, there may not be. 
another alternative. You just may not be able to find one at this point in time and that therefore focus on something else. Um, but um, if there's not an alternative, is there an alternative practice that will enable you to still provide the same service, but without the waste? Um, can you refuse to stock certain single use plastics? Just not even find an alternative, just actually, we don't need to provide swizzle sticks. We have spoons. Why do we need swizzle sticks? I, I love a cocktail, but why when you go to certain places, why do they need to give you the extra bits? It doesn't add anything to me. Why when I buy sushi, do I need that extra little bit of green grass made out of, what is that? Do, that, that adds nothing to my enjoyment of my meal. Um, and just because it's something you've always done, it doesn't mean that's something you have to keep doing. Can you reduce the need for that product or packaging in the first place? Can you repurpose or reuse our items? Like if you have to get it in cardboard, can you repackage that cardboard up and use it for something else? Can the plastic items that you get in the jar, can they be reused or repurposed in another way? Can you send your milk bottles back to your milk bottles, um, your milk provider? Can you send beverage containers back um, and jars for refill? Um, is it possible to recycle items um, that you cannot reuse or reduce? Can you compost uh, your food waste um, or anything biodegradable that you create? Um, and how can you create better decision-making for your customers? Because again, you don't have control over that, but maybe there's some things you can do which will help them. So that's the question for the last part of this is, and you think about your customers or clients or um, you know, people who attend your service, um, how are you gonna help them? because maybe they can make it easier for you. Maybe the onus is not on you to make all the changes. Maybe some of their changes are on them. Um, so how do you do that? And as an advocate for community, um, there's lots of things that businesses can do to make it easier for us. Sometimes they don't want to do those things because they're worried about the backlash or they're worried that it has adverse um, experiences on the quality or enjoyment of the service or product they provide. Um, but it doesn't necessarily have to. And I think it's about worthwhile understanding that there are actually probably a lot of people in your community who would like to do more, but are nervous. They don't want to make a drama for you. They're in that, they're the mainstream. They're not the early adopters. There's sort of these other people who are like, I would do more, but I'm a bit nervous. Um, they might have a bit of social anxiety, which let's face it is pretty tricky to manage when you're asking for something extra. So um, if you're a takeaway venue, maybe you could register to be a trashless takeaway um, uh, venue and, and put a sign up in the window saying we're registered on trashless takeaway. You can bring in your container and I will put your takeaway food in your container and you can break, take it home in your container. That is fine. Um, maybe uh, you can pop yourself on the map um, and uh, as a venue, you can, when people go looking for you, um, it will be obvious that you are someone that they can go to to do that. Um, if, you're, if you're a cafe, you can register as a responsible cafe. Um, you can register all sorts of sustainability initiatives. Um, you can encourage people to bring their own takeaway cup. Um, you can explain that you don't provide single use items um, as some of those um, cafe standards um, articulate. Um, maybe you want to team up with a uh, single, uh, with a reuse solution. Uh, this is replated. It's a, um, a, a takeaway container that's a standard size, which you um, customers can sign up to be part of. Um, it gives you a little bit more control over the type of container that's reused and swapped. Um, again, you can search by venues that will um, team up with replated. So when I turn up with my replated plate, um, that venue is aware and knows that they are okay with accepting it. Um, maybe you can team up with a cup swap scheme. You can have a Husky cup or a um, returner or a green caffeine solution where customers come in and swap um, or they bring in their own um, container, a container from their container library. So there are solutions which customers can be very responsible for. A simple sign on the somewhere in store or on the menu or on the website saying, we're happy to support you to reuse. Um, you know, this is, we're, we're encouraging um, reuse behaviors, that's, that's fine. Or we encourage you to bring your own bag. Or here's some beautiful bags that we've teamed up with um, Boomerang Bags of Hawkesbury. We want 
we we want you to use these please borrow and bring back or, or buy them and and reuse we want you to do this because that social proof and permission is very very important um, giving social license is um, is very powerful and it removes a lot of those barriers which um, can exist uh, maybe you set up something quite visible like is this the world's most innovative solution it's not very glamorous either but if you're a local um, service at the at the camp and you're providing you know you've got mugs and you're not really too worried about fine dining then maybe this is perfect maybe you can encourage the kids to be responsible for their own cup and washing up and making sure that um, this is something that they do and they put it back on their hook it's a very visible solution and a very visible um uh you know uh, exam, uh, idea and conversation starter as well with parents who see it or you know other people who come into the venue. There are some tools that you can use. Um, Taronga's got a litter-free businesses toolkit there. Um, Plastic Free July have lots of posters, lots of resources online. Um, if you're a packet, if you're a company that has packaging on a product, um, you can go and have a look um, at APCO, which is the Australian Package, Packaging Covenant Organization. Um, you can go and look at their sustainable packaging guidelines. So what they recommend, it's all like about those, um, you know, national guidelines around uh, uh, recycling, reuse um, and uh, compostability. Um, but if you are providing a, a product or buying a product, um, there might be some information there that can help you understanding what is a better choice than others. Um, let's be honest, there's sometimes a lot of choices that come. Um, all right, I think I'm almost at the end, guys. So um, I just had um, just some comments there. Uh, you put out all the waste, <laughs> Sharon. Wow, I love that. Sharon's um, laid out the family waste as part of an audit. <laughs> it's quite amazing, really. You don't think you're doing that much until you, it's, um, it's laid out for everyone to see. I'm about to do one with my son's school and it'll be horrific. Um, but what a visual representation of what we're putting in the bin every day. Um, Charlotte made some changes as well. Beautiful, making some meal prep. <laughs> yeah, it's um, we don't always think we're um, we're wasting until till we have a good look. Um, so look, I guess it can all be a bit overwhelming. I know it's been a long session, um, um, but I would encourage you to go and check out um, the New South Wales government's um, plastic ban website. Um, to have a look at those changes, go through some of the questions for your own business, um, start communicating those changes either with upper management or with your staff or with your customers because come 1st of November, it's kind of too late to plan for those changes. Plan for those changes now um, and know that everyone's gonna be in the same boat. So there's gonna be a little bit of acceptance um, but you may as well let people know that you're on top of it now. And it's actually a really great opportunity to reevaluate some of those other plastics in our lives. Do we really need to be continuing to provide items in the same way that we always have? Or is now the perfect invitation to sort of go, all right, I reckon we can do something else here um, because people are going to be accepting of change quite, um, quite readily at that point. Um, and maybe they won't even notice that you've done a few other things as well. So um, a great chance. Um, that's, that's me. I'm, I'd love to take any more questions or specific scenarios if you've got concerns um, or ideas or um, I can also provide these slides and the recording through um, to Charlotte who will be able to send those out as well. So happy to give you all the links and, and bits and pieces too. All right. I don't know, Charlotte, anything else you want to add or say? Oh, just thanks everyone for coming and thanks Joe for putting it on. Um, we'll also, I'll send out um, the presentation and a link to the recording um, and also just a survey to fill out um, about the workshop because it helps us know for future content and also times and dates of when it's most suitable to hold the workshop. Um, and so I'll send all that out sometime this week or next week. Fantastic.
Well, I've given everyone nine minutes of their life back. So you're probably thinking, oh, thank goodness. Um, but thank you all. Um, thanks for being passionate enough to, uh, to attend and give us your time. And um, I wish you all uh, the success with the, the upcoming changes. And for many of you, I'm sure there'll be a lot more changes to come, but it's great to, um, great to see your enthusiasm and, and um, good luck with, with making some change. All right, thanks guys.